Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. <coughs> uh, today we're going to be talking about the absolute basics of bushcraft. Now why is this uh, video? Uh, there are a lot, and I mean a lot of people that watch just a few documentaries on uh, the Discovery Channel and suddenly they are the number one bushcrafter in the entire world. Um, while they never ever have seen a knife or a tree from up close. So that's number one, why this video is intended. Uh, also, as I'm going through all my stuff, which is the basic stuff of course, I will be showing you uh, what can go wrong, how to uh, treat your gear properly and how to use it properly and stay safe of course. This is, well, the absolute basics. So if you already know a thing or two about bushcraft, feel free to skip ahead to a later point in the video. I'll uh, show you where that is right here. Um, so let's go over some stuff that you may need when going into the forest. It's not just a single knife that you can use or it is not just a piece of rope, it is not just a simple hammock, it is not just a first aid kit, it's everything combined. So when you're going out into the woods, of course it is nice to uh, uh, feel happy outdoors, take hikes, uh, nice long walks, perhaps even sleep outside sometimes. and. Well, sooner or later, you're going to get bored with just walking around and you want to do something, right? So many bushcrafters, uh, they go play about a little bit. Then there's a type that, uh, well, knows what is growing around them, like plants and animals that uh, you can eat. They know how to find water and how to purify that, they know how to make fire, and in this complete series we're going to show everything about that one step at a time. When it comes to uh, the basics of bushcraft, there are a lot of people that think that hey, I'm going to carry a knife and that makes me invincible and I can survive in the wild. Uh, the other parts are true. You're not going to survive with just a knife, that's it. You need knowledge, you need practice, and you need to be able to help yourself when you're out there. Because bushcraft is just the art of being able to stay in the wild without the help of modern technology. Okay, it starts with rudimentary tools such as a knife, an axe, and some rope. But if you use all these items correctly, you will soon find out it is actually a very nice place to be out there. Now, why am I not outside right now myself, like most other people that are doing bushcraft videos? Well, the weather outside is and I don't want to f up my tools, so I'm in here at home. And let's just prepare to go outside first. And why do I say prepare? Because I already have the knowledge, I already have the tools, I already have the gear. This is just a small, small bit of kit that I've just grabbed by far from anything. Now, when I take out a knife, and it's easy, uh, when you use a knife, it gets dull sooner or later. It gets dirty sooner or later. And if you can just see the edges, they need sharpening. And if you have 
knives with a wooden handle, such as this one that I made myself. Let's just get her out for fun. I made this knife uh, about two years ago, it's the very first attempt at making a knife. Uh, this is made from uh, the spring lever for Ford Transit. Very first attempt, as you can also see by the handle, it is just held together with bolts. But it works. Now, this also is a working knife, as you can see. Okay, the edges are very crude, rough, and it is as dull as you can imagine. So, as with every knife and every knife type, even if you have a simple folder or a more expensive folder, sooner or later you're going to have to maintain them and make sure that they are This one is still sharp. Don't make that mistake. Let's take the other one. This uh, mock buck, also a folder, has been very terribly abused by a machine. A buddy of mine gave me this one to show you what horrible messes you can make out of a knife. You can clearly see the machine has been eating away the sides and has not even been close to the cutting edge. Which is a terrible thing to do to a knife. So we're going to make this one sharp again. And as with Every knife, make sure you store it safely before doing something else. Um, why is it that I say that? Well, it is really, really easy to get hurt. Now, when you're out in the wild and you don't have the first aid kit with you, you're screwed. Don't make that mistake. Always make sure you store your knife properly. <laughs> now, the best way to sharpen a knife is obviously not to use a frigging machine because the machines they all make one type of edge which is a little bit v-shaped and it won't last very long because the machines they have a certain grit on them and it's not going to be long lasting. Not even if you have a stainless steel knives. <coughs> These are whetstones. And whetstones, they have different types of gritting and they are separated by color. And the finer the grit gets, the sharper the knife gets. So in these two stones I have four different types of grit, varying from very rough to a little less rough. That's the other way around. This is the rough side, this is the less rough side. Then there's an even finer side and a very fine side. And this is about 800 grit. If you don't know what a the, uh, the grid means exactly, I suggest you Google that because research is a good part of being outside. Then, when you're done with the whetstones, you can also start stropping the knife and I will show you that later. But one uh, question that a lot of bushcrafters or aspiring bushcrafters have asked me is Jesus Christ, you have to spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of euros or dollars or whatever currency you like just to get started. Well, that's not true, not at all. Um, let's pick the Mora again. 
Mora produces quite good quality knives. And, well, how much was this one? $10? That's not a lot. Then there is a folding sole. Looks like a folding knife, but it's actually a sole. I got that one for free. Paracord. Well, uh, there's a lot of types of paracord out there. Some are more expensive than the others, depending on the number of lines inside the uh, uh, core. And then there's this type of paracord. Um, shouldn't even be calling it paracord, obviously. Because this stuff is fake. Come on, zoom in properly, your camera. There we go. It does not hold seven strands, it does not hold anything. And it is great practice, though. It is absolutely great practice. Then, uh, oh, got that buckle over there. Ah, Always store your knives properly. The Baco Laplander. A bit smaller than the Mora. Does basically the same. Came in the kit with the sole. And that was it. Um, Fire steels. There are fire steels out there that are well well over a hundred dollars. Let's not buy them when we're just aspiring to become a bushcrafter because these very little things worth one, two, three dollars, I don't know, they work just as good when you strike them properly. Now, why does this one uh, start immediately? On the outside, there's a bit of coating and that protects the fire steel from the elements when it's still in the store. So you first got to scratch that off and then it'll work just properly. A water filter, doesn't cost that much either. This one was $20. <coughs> and it is good for about 70,000 liters of water before you have to replace it. That's a lot. That's over a year. Now, a very simple mesh hammock. $10. And what do I really need to be able to stay outside? A knife to cut with, a knife that can chop, some water obviously. I bring the saw, I bring the hammock, and when it's bad weather outside, I bring a tarp and I just uh, suspend it above my hammock with a bit of fake string. Well, that is that basically. Uh, only thing we haven't talked about yet is a couple of gloves. When you're out collecting uh, stuff to eat, it is always very nice to keep your hands somewhat uh, uh, clean. And of course, it protects you from uh, stinging plants, sharp edges, and you don't f up cutting yourself. Yeah. Well, now let's put these ones away and get a, do a little bit of sharpening. Okay, so here we go. I have taken some water and the stones have been soaking in here for a little bit right now. Obviously, wet stones, wet, they have to be in water. When you're just starting out with the uh, wet stones, it's always a good thing to let them soak in for maybe 10, 15 minutes and reapply some water 
when you are obviously sharpening because you're scraping the water off eventually. Now there's various types of uh, whetstones. Uh, this type here works best with water. There's also types that work best with uh, uh, typical oil, just like any cooking oil you can imagine. And well, these are very cost efficient. They don't cost too much. They do the job very well. And that is why I got these when I just first started out. And I've used them a lot. And you already saw it. The smallest one that I used most has been worn down quite a little bit just because of using it. Well, that being said, let's uh, take out the whetstone with the roughest side first. I always like to put it back in straight. And then there's some techniques, of course, when you uh, are sharpening your knife. There are uh, a lot of videos out there about sharpening your knife. And some of them actually hold va valuable information. But they are so tremendously long. So let's just cut it short. There are videos out there and people, they go straight up and down the sharpening stone. They forget the tip. That is not the right way. When you sharp a knife, you want to make sure it gets done along the entire edge, of course, because you don't want just a knife with a short bit being sharp and the rest is dull. You don't want that. So you just simply start scraping the sharpening stone at about an angle of about 10, 15 degrees. Why is that? Well, easy. If you hold it too flat, the side gets eaten away. So a nice way to uh, f figure out the angle of your knife, just push it down with your finger on the uh, blade so that the uh, spine comes up a little bit. You will then lift it up ever so slightly more so you make sure that the cutting edge is always on the stone now what this does with the grain this one is moving away the and with uh, the rough grit in this case but this is keeping on moving away that's better just a mouse pad that's the trick as I was saying the material of the whetstone obviously is now shaping the knife properly and what it does as i'm going in this direction the material has a friction going the other way so eventually you're going to have to use the other side of the knife and scrape that off as well As you are going along, this will obviously cause some material to be left behind on the west known, which is exactly what you want. There are a number of YouTubers that say you should constantly rinse off the west or keep it even under a running faucet. Don't do that. 
you actually need the scrape of material to get the edge properly. Now, as you're watching me do this, you're probably getting bored and you still haven't seen a forest. So, with the magic of TV, here's a forest for you. And let's also speed things up a little bit because this can take hours and hours and hours and hours of constant scraping. When you notice that your stone is getting a little bit dry and material builds up on top, just wet your fingers, get the stone a little bit wet again and you can continue properly. And don't forget to examine your edge every now and then. Because the stone with the rough grain, it will only go so far before it is finished. And when it is finished, simply flip it up to a lighter grain and continue. Let's get it wet a little bit. Here we go. Another thing to consider is the pressure and there are some things that you want to do, some things you don't want to do and one thing you do absolutely not want to do is put a lot of force on your knife when you're scraping the wet stone. Just let the stone do the work, just gently, lightly scrape the stone and that is more than enough. This one is getting nicely sharp. As you can hopefully see, I'm recreating the bevel, which was destroyed by the machine. Let's get the material off. Maybe you can see it a little bit better then. Hopefully. And you can see a little bit more clear here. <coughs> well, this is basically what you want to do. You want to have a proper edge. Now, as this one was fucked up by a machine, it's going to take a little bit longer than any knife that has seen proper sharpening usages in the past. When you're sharpening towards you, with the uh, edge towards you, that is, it's always nice to see that the edge is actually touching the stone. Now, there are various types of uh, shapes when it comes to knives. Some have a V shape, some have a Some have a bevel that is sharpened only on one side and the other is as blunt as you can find it. And 
there are too many types of bevels to imagine, but one thing that is always nice to show, let's use the big one. This one does not have a proper edge on the side. There's no beginning and no end to where the uh, uh, edge starts, which is different from the Mora, of course, where you can obviously see that. Those types are made for uh, rougher work, like chopping a small tree. And they are less intended for, let's say, cutting an apple or whatever. They are usually also not as pointy. So they are not intended to stab with or defend yourself. Your intended use is rough work. Now these folders, many bushcrafters, they have uh, the folders with them 24 seven. Many survivalists and many criminals also have them on them 24 seven. But they have very different ideas about knife usage. Lord. Well, I guess that's that for this stone. It won't do me any more good. So let's get the other one out. And this is the rougher side and the even finer side. So let's work with this for a while. Hopefully it stays. Now you can hear and also feel the grain of the stone trying to resist the steel of the knife, which is normal. And eventually the material comes off the knife and it becomes just as smooth as the sharpening stone. When you're uh, in this stage of sharpening, make sure you don't cut yourself. I mean, it. Now, as you can see, I'm almost done recreating the edge. Oh, there you go. So, pretty short. We should be able to hold the proper edge. Now obviously with uh, knives that are in use and are properly maintained, sharpening does not take this long. It's just that because this knife has been abused by a machine, don't use machines, you have to recreate the entire battle 
and get it all sharp again because well basically you don't need blunt knives many bushcrafters always say that um, a knife or an axe that you cannot shave with is not sharp enough I agree to some extent a knife that you want to use for light chopping and stuff well you don't actually need a blunt knife because it's taking too much effort to get through With this one right here, when it was still sharp, I've been able to uh, do both some light cutting work, and small dead standing trees uh, of about the thickness of my arm. Well, that's a two minute effort and then the tree was done. And of course you don't chop a tree with a folder. Don't do that. I'm also not a fan of batoning, which is using a hammer or a different log to smash a knife through a piece of wood. And I'll tell you why. There are knives uh, like this folder. Well, they hinge right about here, so that is where the entire knife stops. If you pound it, all the uh, force that is coming down comes on the hinge, and it will break. If not the knife itself, then the hinge. Anyway, you're destroying a knife when you're doing that. Then, there are various types of knives and how they are built, of course. Uh, this one is a full tang knife, which you can clearly see the uh, steel goes all the way to the back. If you baton one of those, the downcoming force is spread evenly across the entire knife and can actually take the force. And because it has a very thick spine, uh, the impact is also not an issue. To compare uh, spines, here's your typical Mora. And here's mine. There is a little bit of a difference, right? Be honest. It's almost like an axe. Which you can actually use it for. Then there are half tang knives and that basically means that the steel does not go all the way through like this one but it stops somewhere halfway the handle. With uh, the mortar knives the handles are half tang and plastic. So they cannot take the impact and they will break. Treat your more than nicely. Or any tool for that matter. Nice. When you have uh, created a proper bevel and it's getting sharp to the point where you cannot uh, properly use a, a whetstone anymore then there are of course uh, some extra tricks that you can use uh, for those that have never heard of stropping uh, that is basically using a piece of leather held under tension and you can uh, uh, then use some stropping compound to get the knife even sharper. Obviously, I'm not going to use this one. I'm not going to use that one. 
And just like the whetstones, these are stropping compound pieces of clay, which you can uh, buy for one or two dollars in almost any DIY store. Now all I need is a piece of leather. Obviously my mouse pad is not leather. Oh, hang on. I got it. Here we go. A piece of leather. Now how am I going to do this? Obviously you guys want to see. Here we go. Now, with a uh, Typical leather belts, there is always a rough surface, which is the inside and a smoother, shiny surface, which is the outside. Uh, we're not using the outside, we're using the rougher inside. Now let's just jam that in there. Here we go. Now, obviously I'm starting with the uh, rougher of the two compounds. And I simply start rubbing that into the leather. And when that is done, I simply uh, do the same as with the whetstones. Always go against the edge. Now, as you can clearly see, hopefully, passing one time was already enough to get a lot of the compound from the belt to the knife, but that is perfectly okay. And this we can simply continue until this compound has either disappeared or you don't feel the resistance from the knife following the leather. And don't worry about staining your belt because when uh, this clay dries up even more, that is the little bits that are not already scraped off by your knife, they will eventually simply fall off. You notice how I'm holding the knife a lot flatter this time? And it's because the belt is obviously flexible and it will follow the cutting edge of your knife by itself. A mess. That is getting sharp all right. This method of stropping has been used since, well, way before the old Wild West. I don't know actually uh, where, did, uh, where this originated. Probably somewhere in China or... Well, who knows? If you know, please leave it in the comment below. I'd like to find out. And you see how the compound material is getting off the uh, belt? Well, I'm not done yet, so I simply add a little bit more and continue scraping.
getting there. is a nice edge but we're not done yet because there's always the finer compound which I'm going to apply next and hopefully the final stage. Cut. Now there's a lot of ways uh, to prove that a knife can actually cut. One of the most popular is the uh, paper test. Now, obviously uh, paper is made from wood pulp and has actually very rough structure for such a fine edge. Then there's the shaving test. Can we shave with it? Well, yes we can. That's a couple of my hairs. Can you see this? No? Yeah, I need a better camera. And... Well, this one will properly cut. Trust me on that one. Now why am I not doing the uh, paper test just yet? Easy, because this one has just been finished sharpening, ready to go back to my buddy, its owner. And as soon as you start cutting, you start dulling your blade, which is not what you want to do. Then, uh, when you repeatedly cut a piece of paper, you're repeatedly using your knife, and that is not going to do a lot of good. So. That is why I'm not a big fan of showing off and making all kinds of shapes and cutting edges, piece of paper, strip, shit. Just trust me on this one. And if you start uh, sharpening your own knives with the whetstones, going from the roughest grain to the finest grain to the clay, you're going to end up with a properly sharpened knife with a proper edge. So thank you so much for watching this video up until this end. And well, if you liked it, please subscribe. Please like the video. Tell your friends about the video, share the crap out of it, and we'll see you next time. Now, what are we going to do next time? Hmm, I'm not sure yet. Leave something in the comments, something that you really want to learn about, and I'll go and test that or do it show it. That's it for now. Bye bye. Thank you. See you next time guys. Right? Hi guys. Um, just before 
uh, we finish this video, you didn't think I actually cut myself, right? So here's the making of movie blood, which I use in my videos. Now, what do you need to uh, get the movie blood made? Some food safe coloring, very simple, powdered sugar, and a little bit of cocoa powder. Now, what do we do? We open the jar. It already has a bit of nice color. Add some water to it. Now, the color is already pretty okay, but it is far too liquid. How to resolve that? Simply add powdered sugar. This makes it a little bit thicker, of course. You want it to have the right consistency to make it convincing, of course. Well, just a touch more. Now the powdered sugar does give the right consistency, but it also makes your blood look a bit lighter. So to resolve that, we just take a little bit of cocoa powder. And add it to the mix. Not too much, you don't want it to be too dark. You can actually drink this stuff. Not that I recommend it because you will turn red. But you can. To speed up this process, you can just close the jar properly, shake it. And then when you open it, Some mush in here. There you go, there's the blood.